Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Robin Mason. I'm with Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries and I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Before we get started, I quickly want to go over some general housekeeping information. Um, as I've mentioned before, your phone lines are muted. That's only to help with distraction from background noise and we get a number of people on the phone at the same time. But please feel free to use that chat box over on the left hand side of your screen if you have any technical questions. If you're having trouble hearing any of the presenters, we can try to get that figured out if you let us know in the chat box. And during the presentation, if you have questions for the presenters, please feel free to type those in the chat box also. We may not pass them along right away, but we do have a record of them and we will be able to get to them at the end of the presentation. Or we may be able to follow up with you via email to respond to your question. Do you want to mention also we are recording this session, so you can feel free to go back and view that at a later date if you want to revisit the information or if there's other members of your team that you think might help find the information helpful. And you will see a link at the end of this webinar where you can access all of the recordings. So again, thank you all so much for joining us today. And I'm now going to go ahead and pass this over to GFAS Executive Director, Kelly Heckman. Thank you, Robin. Robin. Oh, am I echoing again? Okay, no. So, so yeah, my name is Kelly Heckman, and I'm the Executive Director of GFAS. And I'd just like to welcome everybody to our second webinar in our four-part series um, focused on avian adoption. And this is, um, as Robin mentioned, sponsored by GFAS um, and co-organized with Avian Welfare Coalition. Uh oh. So, as part of our, so GFAS is an international accreditation organization. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, and as part of our accreditation uh, program, we recognize excellent among sanctuaries and rescue groups, but also want to engage with those that are not accredited to improve the care of animals, public safety, and sustainability of organizations. For us, our objective in sponsoring these series of webinars is to provide you with the necessary information for uh, helping you with short-term care issues for birds that come to you in need. And from previous AVEN-focused webinars, we've provided that information and heard a lot of um, feedback from you that you wanted to know more information about adoption. And that inspired us to create this um, adoption focus focus series. And so today we're going to be specifically addressing your questions that you've sent us um, during your registration process on how to educate adoptive caregivers on avian issues. Oops. So before we dive into that in a little bit more detail, I just want to you know, remind you that as part of our accreditation, we actually have um, a set of 24 different species-specific animal care standards, and that includes four um, focused on avian groups. And so you can feel free to go to our website and download those standards of care um, for you to review. Um, we also have an, a list of accredited sanctuaries that um, include uh, those specifically focused on avian care that you might be able to communicate with. Um, to address any um, specific avian care needs. And then we also have a website, a web page specifically devoted to avian education, including the list of all the different series um, presentations that we've done in the past. Um, this is the third series that we've done, and you can access all those recorded uh, webinars on our website as well. Um, we also recommend going to a variety of other resources to get more information about avian issues, such as um, our co-organizers on these webinars, Avian Welfare Coalition, um, and then also ASPCA Pro and AnimalShelter.org, who provide um, a lot of really great resources as well. Um, so in this this situation, um, because everybody's so interested in adoption, uh, we actually have a lot of questions to get to today, but that doesn't mean that you should not, um, as Robin mentioned, participate. If we're talking about something and you want us to elaborate or it inspires a related question, you know, please ask, and that makes this more valuable for you, which is absolutely why we're doing it. Um, so with that, I wanna introduce um, Again, our co-organizer for these web, uh, webinar series, 
Um, Denise Kelly is the president, president and co-founder of the Avian Welfare Coalition, and I'm going to hand it over to her to, to address a few issues with you as well. Oh, thank you very much, Kelly, and um, please everyone could join us, and I'd like to express my appreciation to Kelly and Robin for their work on these ep webinars. Um, so pleased to have the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries as our partner to present these uh, webinars to you. Um, the uh, Avian Welfare Coalition formed back in 2000 to create a voice in the animal protection community for captive birds and one of our goals was to expand resources to help birds in need. And um, we felt that reaching out to the animal protection community was a very crucial part of that and to utilize the expertise and infrastructure that they had in place. Um, but what we really wanted to do was provide them with specific tools to enable them to serve birds. Um, our avian shelter outreach program provides those resources online and we also um, work with the Global Federation to present these webinars. Um, for this latest series, as Kelly said, we drew upon the input we received to our previous 2015 webinars and the earlier ones this year. So these are what you want to know more about, and we got the experts to do that. And I'd like to, with that, I'd like to introduce today's experts. Um, first is Lorelei Tibbetts, who is the practice manager at the Center for Avian and Exotic Medicine in New York. Lorelei has a BS in veterinary technology and has worked exclusively with exotic pets since 2003. She's also an adjunct teacher of avian and exotic medicine at a New York-based veterinary technology program and a frequent speaker at national veterinary symposiums. Lorelai is also the founding member and current president of the Vet Tech Specialty Group of the Academy of Veterinary Technicians in Clinical Practice. I might add that she recently received a nice award of recognition, uh, Veterinary Technician of the Year by the New York State Association of Veterinary Technicians. Um, Janet Trumbull um, is the Executive Director of Administration of the Oasis Sanctuary, and she's been there since March 2010. Uh, Janet oversees the organization's financial and administrative functions, as well as manages the direct care provided to, and correct me if I'm wrong, the 800 plus birds and residents. Does that sound about just right? Under, just just, just under, under 800. <laughs> And uh, prior to joining the Oasis, um, Janet worked in the financial industry for 30 years, and I'm sure she's bringing a lot of that experience to the management there. And she actually has been involved with Parrot Welfare since 1979 when she acquired her first bird. With that, I'd like to turn it over, turn it back to Kelly. Great. Well, yeah, so as you can see, we've got some great experts that are going to talk about a variety of topics today, um, which include adoption education, health and wellness, social and enrichment, flight, and then household safety. And these are all, again, in the framework for how you would present the, this information to potential adopters. So our first question that we want to address, what kind of education process should we be doing for new adopters. And I'm going to ask both speakers to name their top three um, issues when it comes to this. And we'll start with, with Janet. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. It's great to be with you today. Um, so I, I considered um, the top three in my book. And really, it's um, basic um, information that we need to give adopters. Um, you know, think about the first time you uh, got a bird. What did you not know? What did you need to learn? So I think a lot of groups um, who do classes, um, it's a wonderful opportunity to get into some really um, basic information about all birds. And then um, possibly uh, if you have an opportunity to do some one-on-one -on -one work with an adopter and the bird that they're interested in, um, then you can probably get into more specific information about that species or that particular bird. But generally, um, I think adopters really need to learn um, basic anatomy um, and health of a bird, 
Um, how do they know when a bird is ill? Um, so signs of illness, you know, uh, droopy eyes. Of course, droppings are a key sign. We look at a lot of droppings, as you all know. And um, so learning what a, a proper dropping should look like versus one of an ill bird is, is something that um, is very easy to teach and um, a good sign of illness. Um, a good diet. Um, sleep requirements for birds um, are really important, <clears throat> excuse me, important factors that, um, that a new adopter should understand. Secondly, um, environment and enrichment. Um, I notice that many of you do home visits, so you may have a, an idea of, the, of an environment that the bird would go into, a proper cage um, a sizes and um, aviary opportunities, things like that. Um, if you aren't doing home visits, maybe um, then giving some better guidelines on um, what is appropriate for uh, the type of bird that you are looking to adopt would be helpful. And enrichment opportunities, um, and we'll get into more detail about that later, but that's a key point to make sure that bird continues to thrive and remains happy. And then thirdly, I think um, behavior and um, um, anything around behavior with that particular species of bird, but in general body language and um, maybe um, um, hormonal or breeding behavior that, that they may not be familiar with. Some people think it's very abnormal when a bird starts to regurgitate <coughs> when we know that, that that's a normal process of the uh, part of the breeding process. So um, having an adopter understand those things um, before they see it is very helpful. And I think most importantly, letting adopters know that there are no silly questions. Again, things that um, we never knew when we brought in a bird. You know, you probably felt embarrassed about asking if that was a normal behavior, but um, you know, letting them know that that we're, we're here to help and, and then nothing is is um, is silly or um, crazy. That it's probably a normal behavior, and they just need to understand what's going on. So, Lorelai, you have some additional information? Well, some of the things I, I think may be helpful. Um, so, I work in a veterinary hospital, and I know when I'm adopting birds to, to people, I spend a lot of time teaching them all of the things that Janet just talked about. But um, so, therefore, I think um, one thing you guys could do is guide people towards good avian veterinarians because we're a huge resource for people who. Um, who need information and you know depending on the kind of shelter you work at you may yourselves not even know exactly how to teach a potential adopter all of the things that they need to know or perhaps you don't have the time to do that so something that you could do is you know uh, sort of passing the buck a little bit but saying hey you need an avian veterinarian anyway go there get the information that they can give you um, and I also did want to mention one of my favorite resources when even I don't have the time that I need to teach people everything they need to know because there really is so much involved in caring for these animals um, is sending them to some of my favorite online resources. I particularly like lafebervet.com. It's um, L-A-F-E-B-E-R for those of you who aren't aware of what it is. They have a lot of free uh, different webinars that they have recorded, some different slideshows, uh, papers. Some of it is medical in nature. Uh, some of it is a little more than clients would need, but a lot of it is really basic, fantastic information about um, a basic anatomy, basic behavioral things. Um, and I think it's a great place to send people to get that information. And for you guys who maybe need more information yourselves on how to care for these animals and some of the basic, most important things you need to know. Great. Um, we'll move to the next question. What are some of the unique challenges of life with a parrot? Or I'll extrapolate other um, companion birds versus a dog or a cat that we should share with adopters without scaring them off. And uh, I'll give this to Lorelai first. Well, I, I think what I one of the things I would say is I I actually kind of like scaring people off because I think too many people are impulse buyers or impulse adopters. I mean, I, I can speak from experience. When I was 18 years old uh, in college, one of the first things I did uh, as an adult on my own is I went out and bought a son Conyer. 
Um, I am embarrassed to say that now because I didn't know anything at the time. And we don't want people to do that. I didn't know that they were extremely loud, that they could be mean and fight. And I, all I knew was they were really pretty. So I do like scaring people. Um, I think as far as challenges with li of life of a parrot, for those of you who don't know, uh, I, I tell people all of the, the bad things. I tell them about the mess that, you know, there's, there's not only feather dander, but food thrown everywhere. Um, the requirements for their feeding go way beyond just a seed mix uh, or opening a dog or a cat food can or something like that. They need uh, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables. They need bird specific things. They need space to come out of the cage. You have to quote bird proof your home, which I think we get into a little bit later. Um, they may not need to get walked like a dog, but they certainly do need a lot of your time and attention. And there's such so many challenges as far as uh, I know for myself, one of the things I wasn't very prepared for in owning birds was uh, the guilt factor, which is when you have a bird, especially if you only have one and maybe you want to go away for overnight or for a weekend and you can't bring your bird with you, but you don't necessarily need to hire a, a pet sitter or you don't want to bring it to a boarding facility or, or even if you just want to go out after work and not come home until late at night. Sometimes you just, I, I started feeling like, oh my gosh, my bird's home alone in a cage. It's a terrible feeling. And I think people with cats probably don't experience that in the same way. And financially, and I know I talk to adopters a lot about money because again, I work at a vet hospital and um, people are never prepared for what it costs to take care of birds. They just don't think that a bird is going to cost the same, let alone more, because we are specialists, um, than a dog or a cat vet. So they come in with their cockatiel and they don't realize that they're going to have significant expense if the bird is sick. And if people can't afford it, uh, you know, I literally tell people, hey, if you were to come back next year and your bird has a broken wing and I tell you it's gonna be $1,600 for surgery to fix it, can you afford that? If the answer is no, I don't adopt a bird to them. Um, so I think scaring them off is sometimes the right thing. I don't know if Janet agrees with me completely on that, but <laughs> it's, it's something that I, I try to kind of use as a tool for determining who really is, is uh, a good potential adopter. Janet, did you have anything that you wanted to contribute to? Well, I'll, uh, yes, I'll add on to that. Um, I, I don't disagree. Um, I, certainly, we don't want to scare off people that um, who could really be good good bird owners and um, provide a loving home for a, for a bird in need. Um, but I do think that being honest about um, life with a bird is really important. And and as Lorelai said, most of the time when people start to hear what it's really like, um, either they will commit or they'll back off and, and find other interests. So, you know, I think just a couple other key points that I would share is really um, the lifespan of a bird. Um, even a, an adopter of a cockatiel, um, you know, if it's a young bird and that bird could live to be 30 years old, you know, if you can really get people to focus on the next 30 years of their life, um, they may realize this is not the pet for them or the companion that they, they had hoped they could have. Um, you know, I had a cockatiel for 30 years, and, and I, when I think back on my life with that bird, boy, did he go through a lot with me. And, um, you know, I was committed to keeping him through all my life changes, but not everybody can. So that's really very important to, to get people to think about. Uh, you know, young people who aren't married or who, who want to get married and have children and or travel, you know, those are all things that might impact their decision. And then my second most important part is um, I think getting people or, or an adopter to understand that when they take home their new bird, um, that it may take some time for that bird to gain their trust. Um, a cat or dog is probably going to be in their lap that night cuddling and, and loving on that person, but a bird, it could take months, it could take years, depending on that, that bird's life situation. So I think that's really important for adopters to, to be aware of that there would be some work involved in, in gaining that bird's trust and having it become a good companion pet. Yeah, very good points. Um, 
Oh, sorry. Any tips? And I know this is a very broad topic, so maybe a, just your co top couple tips on how best to match a potential adopter's personality and lifestyle to certain species or individual birds. And I know again it's broad, but maybe um, Janet, if you want to start, if you had some tips. Sure, I had some just some key points. Um, there's lots of things we can consider, and of course, you're going to get to know an adopter over time, but certainly looking at their lifestyle. Um, so a person who works and travels a lot, um, a cockatoo probably isn't the best bird for them. They tend to need a lot more attention, and so having the human out of the home um, will probably be a bit detrimental to their, their health and their existence. Um, so just, you know, when you look at lifestyle of the adopter and the needs of each individual species, and there's some species that do very well um, and are more independent and, and can live longer on their own, so to speak. Um, but lifestyle certainly is an important um, aspect to look at. Uh, individuals that live in condos or apartments, um, noise factor is the big thing. So you think big birds, that would be a problem, but there are small birds like sun conures who make a lot of noise and constant noise that could be very disturbing to close neighbors. Um, so I think considering, you know, the housing arrangement um, and where that bird will be and, you know, if they're going to be vocalizing normally, will that impact neighbors um, that could have problems with that? Um, another uh, really important point is considering individuals um, with uh, allergies, asthma, any respiratory issues, uh, should not adopt birds that have feather dander or feather dust. So cockatoos, African greys, cockatiels. Um, ultimately, they're going to have to give up their birds um, for health reasons. And I can tell you that I see that a lot um, with birds coming to sanctuary. Um, it's not really the birds necessarily the problem, but the owners have medical issues and just can't keep continue to keep the bird uh, in the home. So those are some of the key um, key points I would touch on. Right. Laura? Um, those are all really great points. Uh, I would probably also add maybe people's financial situations. Um, there's some, you know, certainly I spend a lot more money on my macaw as far as toys, food, things like that, uh, rather than my, uh, you know, the smaller birds. You know, budgies and, and cockatiels and things like that and maybe just getting to know people's personalities a little bit I think I think that you know some birds suit certain personalities better um, you know some of the more quieter pionis type parrots might be better suited for a quiet person you know I tend to be a loud person so I, I actually am very attracted to the loud birds I love singing and dancing and screaming with them but other people may not be that into that kind of a bird so it, it really um, is important to, to get to know who your potential adoptees are a little bit before um, letting them take a bird. Great well moving into health and wellness um, and I'm gonna since Lorelai has a medical background I'll let her kind of focus in on some of these health and wellness questions how often do you advise that adopters bring their birds in for a well bird exam and what goes into a well bird exam? So I, I think the most important thing for shelter people to, uh, to know would be to ensure that people go to a vet at, at the very beginning. It's by far the most important exam. Um, like I mentioned, um, these birds are, are, are going to be, these people are going to be needing a little extra education, assuming that perhaps the shelter wasn't able to do the, you know, the complete education they'll need. So hopefully the vet will be able to fill in the blanks. Um, I noticed somebody put a, a, a question up or a comment about just because a vet sees birds doesn't necessarily follow that the vet is an avian vet. And that is very true. There's a, a, a difference between a board certified avian veterinarian, somebody who has pursued and achieved board certification versus a, a, a veterinarian who likes birds and sees them. Not that those people can't do a decent job, just they're, just people should recognize there's a difference um, in, in probably the education of those veterinarians. So what what I recommend is they should have this first initial bird exam uh, when they're adopted. And what goes into that well bird exam is obviously the physical exam is the most important part. Um, we we do 
when I recommend annual checkups there and after, I think a lot of times people say, well, what am I going to bring my bird in for? He's perfectly healthy. He's fine. Well, a lot of times, especially a board certified avian vet is going to be able to recognize subtle changes that maybe you're not going to understand or recognize at home. We do, you know, like any other animal, eyes, ears, nose, throat. We can recognize changes in the eye, behind the eye. We look at the body conformation and make sure there isn't significant weight loss or weight gain. We make sure there's no abnormalities with the feathers or the preen gland. Um, we're able to do grooming and all the physical needs. And these are all really important for birds, I believe, on an annual basis. But certainly that first time is the most important. And then the most important part about what goes into these well bird exams and i tell clients this all the time when i'm trying to encourage them to come in more regularly rather than just when there is a problem is that we get to teach them things um, we are constantly learning we are constantly going to continuing education avian medicine is always changing and when we learn we teach our clients we help them understand how to take better care of their birds, um, whether or not to trim their wings, how to exercise your bird better, all of the things that go into keeping your bird healthy for longer. And even if it's just a, a physical exam and a conversation for a half an hour, it's worth it for people, in my opinion, to, to do that on an annual basis, touch base with their vet, be a part, you know, the vet gives the vet a chance to be a part of that uh, bird's life and family and, and really uh, be part of their long-term health plan. Super. What medical testing do you recommend the doctors do when bringing a new bird into their home, which I guess you're kind of briefly touched on, but maybe a little more in detail. And yeah. what about quarantine? How long should adopters quarantine new adopted birds? So medical testing that I would recommend the first time for any new bird that hasn't had these tests, especially if they're coming out of a shelter or sanctuary type environment where they were probably exposed to many other birds, um, definitely a baseline blood panel. I usually explain it to people like that. It's the same kind of a test you'd have if you went to the doctor. We're going to be looking at a complete blood count, red and white blood cells. We're going to be looking at liver function, kidney function, cholesterol level. Um, we're going to be looking at electrolytes just to get a baseline um, evaluation of what's happening internally. And there are some infectious diseases that can be passed and spread and lie dormant within birds that would be good to know if the bird has been exposed. It may or may not ever cause an illness in the bird, but it's certainly something I think clients have the right and should want to know uh, to ensure their investment, to ensure they know what's happening with, with their new pet. So for me, it's a little species specific and the way we do it at our practice is old world birds, cockatoos, um, uh, African greys, those birds we test for citizen beak and feather disease, circovirus, um, which can cause problems with them. Uh, new world birds can get these diseases, certainly if they've been exposed to each other. Um, but we, we do see it more in the old world species. And then every bird uh, can benefit from a chlamydia test, also known as psittacosis. They used to call it parrot fever. There's a thousand names for it, but um, it's not a virus. It's a bacterial infection that birds can kind of harbor and uh, get sick with, especially in times of stress. And of course, adoption is, if nothing else, a very stressful time for a bird going into a new home. So these are the things Two, two of the basic tests we would recommend in addition to a baseline panel. Um, I did also mention, want to mention somebody put a post up saying their vet offers annual radiographs as well to differentiate internal organs. Um, you know, vets practice medicine in different ways. X-rays are a fantastic way to get more information. Um, a lot of times it requires sedation. I'm not a big fan of sedating any animal if they don't need it. We probably, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that annually if you have to sedate the bird or if it's extremely stressful for the bird. But it, of course, it's a fabulous diagnostic tool, especially if you suspect a problem. Um, quarantine is, is sort of tied into this, uh, depending on the kind of birds you have and what birds you have at home. So if you are doing a proper quarantine, your, your, the idea is to not expose the new bird to existing birds for the length of time that any per possible or predictive disease could take to manifest. And that time uh, is considered to be 90 days. 
I don't, other than zoos, uh, know of any facilities that are able to practice proper quarantine for this time because of space limitations. And most clients or potential adopters are not they don't want to wait 90 days. They want to introduce the birds right away, or maybe they don't have the space to do that. So we definitely recommend, okay, let's do the baseline testing. Let's get an idea of the bird's health. Keep the bird quarantined for a minimum of a month, um, as long as clients are able to do that, um, and then consider a slow introduction to the flock. Um, it really depends on the individual situation and whether or not they're going to allow or permit testing. If they are not going to be doing a vet visit or any diagnostic testing, 90 days really should be practiced because within that time, if the bird doesn't break with an illness, they're probably okay. I think that's, I'm scan these questions, but I think that's it. Uh, um, yeah, well, so somebody, go ahead. Well, I didn't know if you want me to address some of these questions that people ask. Happy to if you if we have time, but I could also. Wait um, I, guys tell me. I think let's let's see how far we can get in. And again, like for questions we don't get to now, if, if we have time at the end, we'll come back to them. And if um, if we don't have time, then um, hopefully our presenters will be happy to address those questions and get those answers to you via email. But not to say that you shouldn't continue to ask those questions, um, but we just want to keep this trucking along a little bit. Um, what are the signs of illness that adopters should be aware of? Uh, Janet mentioned earlier looking at the stool. Um, Laura, you have any? Yeah, I think the, so. Definitely looking at the poop is a great way of understanding birds' health. You do need to be able to explain to clients what they're looking for as far as what's normal, because poop can vary, especially even throughout the day. If you give your birds some cherries and pomegranate, you don't want the adopter thinking it it's, has bloody poop. So I usually just really quickly will tell people the poop is made up of three different parts. There's urine that's clear, there's urates or uric acid, which is white, and there's feces, which is brown or sometimes green. You should be able to see all three of these in, in each poop. Um, diarrhea doesn't just mean a lot of uh, urine or, uh, so a lot of times people say my bird has diarrhea, but when you actually are evaluating the poop, the stool itself, the fecal part is actually normal and formed, but really what they have is polyuria or excessive urination, which is of course a, a problem potentially, but it's a different, very different kind of problem. So I usually kind of give people that little bit of education and then I, and I have them just monitor what's normal for your bird um, if you see significant change and that change is consistent such as a foul odor or true diarrhea, or true um, polyuria, or excessive urination, um, or severely dark stool um, to black can either mean uh, digested blood, or it can mean that the bird is not eating. Those are our problems. And of course, frank blood, red blood, um, that is obviously uh, a significant sign of illness as well. So we do like people to be educated about poop and to look at it a lot. Um, other signs of illness, birds, birds, if I, they brought their bird in and they said, oh my God, he's just getting so fat, he's gaining weight, and really the bird is just fluffing their feathers and underneath they're like emaciated little, little bones. And um, telling people and helping them understand that the, a bird should, the feathers should as a general rule be sleek and plastered to the body, um, but when they're ruffled and fluffed, for a prolonged period of time, that can be a sign of illness. Um, inability to perch or stand on their perches, uh, drooping eyelids, excessive sleeping, any signs of uh, unthrifty feathers, like they're not grooming themselves or preening themselves properly. Change in voice is another big one. We hear a lot of times we'll notice that, notice that frequency of vocalization may have changed. And obviously appetite changes are a big thing. Um, anytime they notice that their birds are not consuming a normal amount of food um, or even an excessive amount of food could also be a sign of illness. Um, I kind of like to just tell people that once you get to know your bird, 
any sign, any change in behavior could be something or it could be nothing. As Janet said earlier, there are no silly questions. People send me videos all the time and I'm like, oh, it's nothing. He's just being silly. And then uh, they'll send me another video and I'll say, hey, that's actually looks like a neurologic problem. Bring him in. I don't expect clients to necessarily know and be able to diagnose their own bird, but I do think they should be able to recognize a difference, a change, and ask us questions or ask their vet questions if they um, if they notice a change that that could or could not be significant. Um, so I do think it's really important to let them know just to to always ask again, develop a relationship with a veterinarian so that you can email them and ask them. I don't answer emails from people who are not clients of mine. They need to they need to be someone we know already and have established a relationship with. So so people should be made aware of that. Right. And I also, um, as we transition, I believe, into the next section, yeah, um, that the first web series that we did um, with Avian Welfare Coalition was focused more on care. So if, if you all have any specific questions um, about care, um, some of these topics were, were covered in our earlier web series. Um, so now we're going to transition. Um, again, lots of topics in this in this framework, um, social enrichment. Should we encourage people to get more than one bird? Uh, is it okay if they're different species? And I'll let Janet take this one. Thank you. Um, my thought is that this is a new adopter um, and this person's not owned a bird before. Um, I would highly recommend one bird only. Um, there's gonna be a lot to learn um, and and putting a second bird in the mix just might cause um, more frustration and um, angst for that new adopter. Um, so I, especially if it's a, a bird that might have some behavioral challenges or even medical conditions, if you have a handicapped bird, um, we certainly want a new adopter to be more comfortable working with that one bird and getting to understand um, how to best care for that bird. And certainly, if they have an interest down the road um, on, uh, about adding a bird to, a, to their flock, then um, you know I would certainly consider that. Um, one thing I um, am, am very uh, pro is um, for bonded pairs. I never want to split up a bonded pair. When we get birds into the sanctuary, we make every effort to keep those birds together. Sometimes we find out that they're not really a bonded pair. Maybe in the home, uh, what's the saying? You know, love the one you're with. In the home, they're they're very um, what appears to be bonded to the bird they're with. But when they get around other birds, that that uh, can change. Uh, but if you do have a bonded pair and there's uh, an adopter that's interested in that pair, I would say yes. Then I would adopt two birds to that person just to keep the birds together. That will help those birds transition easier and certainly uh, be happier in their life if they're with the one they love. Um, and we do see sp uh, pairs of uh, bonded pairs with different species, as in this picture. We have a pair just like this at the sanctuary. And, um, you know, as long as the adopter um, is comfortable um, taking the time to learn about the different species and um, address the needs of each of those birds, then I think it's a, a, it's a good place for the birds um, to go then. And of right. course, we want to do what's right for the birds. Sure. Um, what out of cage activities do you recommend when talking to adopters about enrichment? And just because we monopolized Lorelai for a while, I'll start with Janet again. Okay. Well, I think the picture kind of says it all. Um, <clears throat> We certainly don't want the birds um, coming into the home and trying to chew it down. Um, so we want to give them activities that um, that will engage them and, and um, give them opportunities to be active without pulling off the plaster on your walls and chewing your cabinets. Um, so I think you know certainly out of cage time is very important for every bird. Um, if it's possible, um, it may take time to get a bird to that point comfortable to, to come out of its cage and interact with a family or um, their new adopter. Um, so having a uh, play area 
of where the bird could go and know that that's a safe place um, is a good idea. A play stand, maybe it's the top of their cage where they can have um, toys. Uh, but certainly encouraging them to to do out of cage activities is important. Um, I am of the mind that you know buying lots of bird toys is great and um, spending lots of money on things that that other people make is wonderful. But I really try and use activities around my home. Um, you know, I have a, a bird that loves to play under the sheets, so we do a lot of, of playing on the bed uh, and just you know playing in the the blankets and the sheets. Um, using Tupperware lids and bowls and things like that to throw around and play with, anything that I can um, find in my home that's safe and engaging for those birds is, is um, something that I look to do with the birds that I have here at home. Uh, so you have to be creative sometimes. And often on a play stand, a bird may get bored um, and look to expand their horizons and, and venture out. And that's okay, but I think supervision and, again, finding areas that they can be in that would be safe and entertaining for them is important. Great. And so we got a question, and I think that's it's, – it refers back to um, the paired species, but I think it's, a, it's an important one. So the question is, but a dusty bird paired with the macaw, I have heard, can – um, be a problem for the macaw's respiratory system. So I guess maybe not being so specific, but Lorelei, are there some certain species that would be, like what are some considerations that would be bad pairings if we're doing a, a multi-species household? You know, it's funny because I, I have seen multiple pairs of African greys and macaws that these macaws do have respiratory problems. There has never been a clinical study proving that it's because of the African gray dander that makes them have these respiratory issues. Uh, so there's no real uh, medical proof that it's an allergy or that it's uh, hypersensitivity to the dander, but I'll tell you, it is a pretty big coincidence. I've seen it several times. Um, so as a general rule, I do kind of, if, if somebody is thinking about that kind of a pair, it is something I would mention to them. Um, that being said, there are macaws that live in homes with cockatoos and African greys and never have a problem. So it's, it's one of those things. To me, the, the biggest concern is just safety. You know, they're, it, it's cute to see a large bird and a small bird, you know, when they're cuddling, but it's not cute when the large bird bites the small bird in half. So I think as a general rule, safety needs to be the most important thing. Um, but I ha you know, I have a, an Amazon that lives with uh, Jen Day Conyer and they're very happy together and cuddle all the time. So, and I wouldn't wanna split them up. Um, so I, I agree with Janet on, on that. Health-wise, uh, there, there, there isn't uh, a whole lot more to be said with pairing other than that has been mentioned. Great. Um, are there certain types of toys that birds are most attracted to, um, referring to safety, um, or would you avoid some that a doctor should avoid? Um, Janet, you kind of spoke to um, some of the toys you use in your own personal household. Um, are there, are there any that you would avoid? Um, well, yeah, there are certainly lots of things to avoid, um, you know, and especially if you're buying um, toys out of the retail market, you always want to make sure that the uh, that the parts are safe, um, you know, that there aren't little beads that big birds could swallow or certainly um, what the, the contents of the toy are made of. So anything that might have certainly zinc or lead uh, would be a problem. Uh, I think nowadays, you know, most toys um, are are much safer than they used to be, but there still are times when we find toys that that I would consider unsafe. Painted toys, um, you know, things that aren't uh, vegetable dyed but painted. So certainly that things like that you want to look for. Um, you know, bells that might have small clappers that could come off. Things like that. Um, so just be very aware of the parts of toys that you might buy, and go, that holds true for anything in your house too. You know, if uh, you give your bird a remote control. Um, a lot of people think, well, it's fun to watch them chew, chew off the buttons, but what's inside? You know, what can they get to inside that would be unsafe? 
Yeah, I want to, I would add to that too. One of the things I really don't like and I try to discourage are those, um, are basically anything that a bird could perceive as a nest, like those little happy huts or little circular fluffy things that birds like to climb into. It just stimulates reproductive behavior. I think we're going to touch on that later, but I really discourage that for, for birds in captivity and, um, and try to try to avoid things, including even just birds that play in cabinets and go into drawers. I have a lot of clients who say, "Oh, my bird lives in the kitchen cabinets." Well, that's cute and and all, but it's it, they tend to think that's their nest. Um, so I would uh, avoid that kind of thing. And I have seen, from a medical perspective, many birds severely injured on toys. Um, I've seen them get their heads stuck in uh, inappropriately sized rings and can't get them out. I've seen uh, clips get caught under the beaks that literally go all the way through the beak. I've seen leg bands get caught in many, many broken legs. So do be careful. Buy, uh, if you're going to be buying toys from the market, uh, try to really inspect them and make sure they're durable enough for the kind of bird you have and, um, and are, don't have sharp edges, sharp parts that could, that could, you know, puncture. Uh, I, probably seen seen it all and, and, and that anything that can go wrong will go wrong with these things so you gotta be careful about that. I think that I think toy um, uh, this conversation it's a good uh, part to add into any education classes you have get some toys that are bad and show an adopter you know mm -hmm. what you would consider a bad toy um, or what parts might cause a problem that Lorelai has just mentioned you know just seeing the visual sometimes uh, sets in a little a little better for a person who's new um, to this this type of uh, of need to watch for things like that. Well, Lorelai, you predicted it um, that yes, uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about reproductive behavior. Um, so maybe you could elaborate on um, that discussion with some tips for discouraging reproductive behavior. Um, you mentioned you know certain toys might encourage nesting. Um, any other, any other tips? Yeah, the, it's a big topic. Um, birds are reproductive. I guess I should back up and say the reason we don't like to encourage reproductive behavior are, uh, for me, well, there's two reasons. One is uh, behaviorally, people tend to find their birds become a lot more aggressive when they're reproductively active. That's when people get bad bites. It damages the bond with the birds. And again, the last thing we want are for these birds to have to be rehomed because the owners are scared of them. And number two are the health risks involved when these birds are reproductively active, both males and females. Um, I've seen many, many prolapses in male birds that uh, we've had to euthanize because we can't correct them. Um, we've, of course, seen a bazillion egg-bound birds and uh, calcium-depleted birds that are just such prolific egg layers due to stimulation of their reproductive uh, behavior. So things, the most common things that pitfalls that people fall into are um, alloprening, uh, basically masturbating their birds that they are not aware of, um, rubbing them too much on their back and over their their sides, um, excessive grooming of the face and neck, and just being too amorous with the bird. It's, it's, it's a wonderfully bonding experience. We all know that, but if you do it to excess and then during certain seasons, you, you can cause a lot of problems. Um, birds need a lot of sleep. I think when people don't have the appropriate diurnal cycles for their birds, um, they are very, very stimulated by the photo period. So you know, um, if people are awake watching TV, playing with their birds until 11, 12 at night, and then wake up at six, get the birds up to go to work, that is not enough sleep. And the birds are going to think it's, you know, time to start breeding. It's the springtime. And uh, we do see a lot of reproductive behavior uh, that's induced because they're just not getting enough rest and the photo period is off. Um, I don't know if Janet wants to add to this. There's, there's so many. <laughs> There are, there are a lot. I had a long list. Um, I think also if you are handling your bird and start to see um, demonstrated breeding behavior, so a bird that might start regurgitating to you or, um, you know, doing their little happy dance, whatever, uh, put that bird down. Don't handle it. Don't encourage that behavior um, so that you can 
try and nip that in the bud. Um, and then also, Lorelai, you, you can probably touch on this. I think diets um, can affect uh, mm -hmm. breeding behavior, too, so high in fat, protein, and starch. Um, starchy foods will uh, indicate uh, it's time to start yeah. because I have you know, good ability to feed. I mean, yeah, it's it's when when the when the environment is right, then they're thinking, oh wow, okay, I've got the best possible food, so my body is capable of making eggs. You know, in many instances, now I have a nest available, and I'm getting nonstop allopreneing from my chosen mate. All the, that that's just the the perfect situation for a bird to start um, laying eggs. And I also also, I guess I'm, oh, all at once. Um, I just wanted to mention that the reason why um, you know this is brought up, although as Laurel I mentioned, we could probably have a whole webinar on just this, but that birds can't be spayed and neutered, and we want to not um, you know. Well, they can. It's just a very risky procedure. We we do it when we have to, not because of prevention. Just sorry. Uh, well, no, thanks for the clarification. But it's it's something that you know. In the dog and cat world, we take for granted, and you know we know we realize as you know dog and cat community that you know we want to prevent overpopulation because there's not enough homes for for dogs and cats to go into, and it's risingly that problem for birds, but you know for a number of reasons, birds being wild animals, um, you know it's it's pretty on the it's borderline whether you know we should be putting birds into a home environment, um, especially those that are, are wild birds. So it's really only due to pure necessity. Um, there's just not enough capacity in animal sanctuaries like Oasis for birds to go into. So, so we're putting, you know, birds that, you know, while for GFAS, we encourage a natural existence, but given how many birds that are out there, um, they're going into homes. And so I just want to emphasize that point when we're talking about reproductive, reproductive behavior that, um, you know, you have to be actively aware of those behaviors so that you can curtail additional um, new animals coming into the, to the community. And working with, may I add, working with an, an adopt, an, a new adopter who isn't familiar with these behaviors, I think is probably the most important issue. Um, most birds are relinquished, um, or owners get fed up at the point when those birds um, start demonstrating those behaviors, and again, showing that more aggressive um, uh, personality. Uh, so really understanding what to expect any time of year based on the species they have, and how to manage that um, so that the bird can remain in the home is, is most important. It can, you know, be a couple of months of, of pain and, and a lot of extra work to get a bird through that, and once they get over that, that need um, for breeding, uh, you know, they return to their normal happy self, then, uh, you know, an owner can, can uh, get back to being, you know, happy, happy family again. But um, that, I think that's really important for a new adopter to understand that there's going to be times when they're going to have to deal with these things, and giving them uh, the tools to work with that uh, through that period is really important. And if they're adopting a bird that's not sexually mature, um, I think understanding when that point is going to happen, you know, uh, to be prepared um, is really important. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think most of the birds that are relinquished to the oasis for aggressive behavior are typically birds that are hitting sexual maturity, and the owner is just at their wit's end because they don't know how to manage it. Mm -hmm. Well, again, just to move on, this is a great topic, um, but even, even more important um, to think about, yeah. not more important, but equally important, is flight um, and how important that is to birds' natural existence. Um, so given our, our lack of time, we're running short, uh, not surprisingly, um, maybe, Janet, could you just add a, you know, what are, what are your key points that, a, that an adopter needs to know about flight? Well, when I saw this question, my first thought was, well, my three key points are health, health, and health. Um, birds, 
um, health is dependent on their ability to fly. Um, so we have learned a lot, and Lorelai can certainly touch more on this, about the benefits of flight and long life for a bird. Um, my one point um, that I've learned over the years is um, it also helps a bird to really own their birdness. They they understand what it, it what a what it means to fly. They're more self confident. Um, birds who have been clipped or never learned to fly, or maybe are handicapped and can't fly, um, tend to be a little more. Um, uh, less independent and a little less confident about their abilities to move around, and, and maybe that could cause injuries for them, um, which then in turn could cause phobic, phobic behavior or feather plucking and, and mutilation. So really it, it, it is a very important um, psychological impact to the bird as well. Lorelai, do you have anything to add? Oh, sure. I mean, flight flight is by far one of the most important things that I talk to, to clients about. And they, a lot of people come to us, they've been trimming their birds for, for years, and the birds don't even remember or never learn how to fly. But we see so many birds that are, you know, living longer than ever because of better veterinary care and better diets, but they are not getting the exercise that they really should be getting. And we see tons of heart disease in parrots, tons of uh, various liver and lipid disorders from obesity, and not to mention the, the mental health issues involved with birds that can't fly. And, you know, like Janet was touching on, we see so much feather destructive behavior and self mutilation. And there's no doubt in my mind that um, the birds that fly and are encouraged to fly and get proper exercise are much more mentally healthy. And, you know, when, when you take away the, the one thing that birds are designed to do, uh, it creates so, so many psychological problems for them. And when you combine that with the, the physical detriments, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I, I, I feel so passionately that people's birds should fly. I, I, it's, it's not quite, but almost on my list of do not adopt if they must let them fly. And, and I, there's a couple of exceptions that I would make for clipping birds' wings. Um, I don't know if we have time to discuss them, but. Well, I think let's move on and just talk about, you know, you, you, I think you both referred to having, you know, the safe environment. So, the next question is, would you describe some simple ways that adopters can create a safe um, free flight zone for birds in their home? Lorelai, since you're... Um, I think, so it depends on the size of the bird. You know, like I mentioned, I have a rescued green wing macaw. I live in a one bedroom apartment in New York City. I'm incredibly lucky that I do have very high ceilings. Um, but I do a, when I and I have to make her fly. She, she'll she'll sit there all day if I don't force her to. But I will pull her across the room around the corner and force her to fly several times a day. You have to make sure you have proper places for them to land. I think one of the biggest problems we see is that birds crash into things and get hurt. And um, you need to teach them like this is your either play stand or your tea stand, or this is a dresser that I'm okay with you landing on. Make sure that they're taught these is where, this is where you can land so they're not just crashing into walls or mirrors or windows. Um, smaller birds, this is a lot easier uh, because they can get a lot better exercise in smaller spaces um, and definitely, um, I think the obvious things like covering, closing window blinds if you need to, shutting ceiling fans off, making sure toilets aren't flushing, um, there isn't pots of boiling water, and um, just making sure that there are not open windows, doors opening and closing, even if it means putting a little note up outside the door saying birds free flighted, don't enter or, or knock first or whatever you need to do um, are, are good options for it. For, and I'm, of course, referring to indoor flight, unlike the picture here where that's outdoor, which would be ideal, but assuming most people don't have the ability to do that, have an outdoor aviary, these are just mm -hmm. you know, indoor flight ideas. Well, and maybe this, maybe you can touch on, you know, the possibility of unflighted um, considerations with this question. Are there different safety risks to birds that um, is flighted versus unflighted? So again, just 
Let Lorelai start with this. Um, I think what I hear a lot from people when I'm trying to, to dissuade them from clipping the wings is they say, well, I have a cat or I have a dog, and I am worried that if I let them fly, they'll go over and try to play with them. Well, my argument to this is I would so much rather your bird could fly away from them um, I'm much more worried about your bird going to the floor and not being able to get away. And when you put it to people like that, they start to rethink things. But my exceptions to clipping would be if I can assess a situation and understand and believe and can f provide follow-up that it's temporary. Um, I think there are some times when birds become um, aggressive, unruly, dominant, and even just taking a couple of the flight feathers so that they are, um, I don't know how to say it, but just a little less uh, territorial, a little less aggressive, sometimes is required in order to give an owner a chance to work with the bird and reestablish trust if there's been some biting or aggression issues. And, and there, those might be some times where I would agree to do some uh, light trimming. Um, uh, maybe Janet can expand on that and give her opinions on it. Yeah, I agree. I actually have an African gray that, that I did that with. Um, during his, his terrible twos, he was pretty unruly, and just clipping a few of his flight feathers, he was still able to fly enough that, you know, he could safely get himself somewhere, but he didn't have as much control to, to uh, finish a mission, so to speak. So he yeah. calmed down a little bit. He realized he couldn't get things, get be, be aggressive to me that way. Um, so that that did help him through those years. Um, and I think one other really key important point about flight is a lot of folks, um, and especially um, um, larger birds who are who have their flight feathers who don't demonstrate um, good flight skills. People will take them outside. Oh, my bird's never flown. We need to really mm -hmm. make sure adopters understand that any bird that has flight feathers needs to be secured if they're going outside, even if they're carrying them to an outside aviary. They need to be in a carrier or on a harness because um, all it takes is, is one um, scare or gust of wind to take that bird off. And even if they've never flown before, they're going to start flapping and that bird could, could well be gone. Yeah, very good point. Well, and good segue into various hazards. Um, again, we're we're now officially running long, so um, Janet, could you maybe touch on a, a couple of top hazards um, for birds? Maybe uh, top hazards are not so obvious. Sure. No, well, not so obvious. Okay. Well, maybe mine were pretty obvious. Teflon is, is certainly one that I think we all know, but um, new adopters may not be familiar with. Mm -hmm. And not just Teflon pots and pans, but anything Teflon, um, irons, curling irons, things like that. Open doors, that's pretty obvious. Other pets, um, that's a big consideration. We've talked about cats and dogs. Even if a bird is in its cage, it's um, it's a sitting duck for, for a predator. Um, you know, a dog could certainly grab a leg or a wing through a cage bar and, and injure a bird. So that's a big consideration. And then chemicals, um, you know, if a, especially if a bird is, is roaming the home, um, can get into cabinets and things like that. You want to make sure things, uh, chemicals and cleaning supplies are secure. I want to add, those are all awesome and good. Um, we see tons of traumatic injuries from birds just getting sat on, stepped on, and crushed in doors. Birds that people don't realize their bird is sitting on a door and they shut it really quickly and they break both legs or worse. Um, I, we see something like that probably weekly. Um, it's people, people cause a lot of trauma that they, you know, inadvertently when their birds are not, they're not aware their birds are underfoot. Oh. <laughs> It's horrible. I know it's awful. It is. Uh, so, so Janet, you kind of touched on this. Um, what do people need to know about interactions with other companion species like dogs and cats? And I'll send it well, back to you. My, you kind of started that. Yeah, my thought is, if there's a house full of dogs and cats, I would not adopt a bird into that household. Um, and Laura, like, I, you know, I've heard a hundred million stories about. Uh, birds being injured by dogs and cats, and um, to me, it's just not a risk I would want to take um, um, with 
inter intermixing those species together. Totally, yeah. I, we, I, I mean, just just three days ago, uh, golf and cockatoo came in. The pit bull got a hold of it for the second time, and uh, it's 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 to me that's uh, one of those homes I wouldn't adopt to. They they're, they're not a good home for a bird. No matter how many times someone, I do see situations where a bird and a cat have lived together and never had a problem. It's just I always say until the one time they do, so mm -hmm. and it will happen eventually. What about other species? Um, rabbits. Um, and it, are there other companion species that are are good fellow companions for birds? Well, other exotic animals t don't tend to create. I mean, we're talking about predator and prey, so rabbits are not predator species. Reptiles don't tend to cause problems, although you do need to wash your hands in between t handling reptiles and and birds. Um, and uh, maybe ferrets. I wouldn't put a bird in a home with a ferret, or at least certainly not a, a small bird that you know, the ferret could get a hold of. Um, mm -hmm. Fish would be good. <laughs> <laughs> good suggestion. <laughs> um, we have an adopter, adoption prospect with a smoker in the family. How do we deal with this? Um, we're like, how do you, do you I mean, if, people, if someone's going to, if somebody smokes, they shouldn't have a bird. It gets not only, even if when people tell me, well, I smoke out the window or I go outside to smoke, I, I can tell the second someone walks in with a bird and I pick the bird up, it's the first thing I smell. And they say, oh, well, they don't even smoke in the apartment. It's because it's on your hands, it's on your clothes, and you're handling the bird and the tar and the nicotine and the poison and the toxin is going, the second you touch your bird, it gets on their feathers. Birds then preen themselves and they ingest it. It is, it's just, it's a, if someone smokes, they, sh they shouldn't have birds, in my opinion. Um, I, I try to really encourage people to quit when they, if it's not an adoption situation and I'm just educating them, um, if not for themselves, then for their birds. Because I always tell people, I care more about your bird than I care about you. So <laughs> just quit smoking for your bird. <laughs> Well, um, I guess that's, well, since, since we're already running late, I'll have one more question. Um, going back to the cats and dog issue. So would you think that there's any possibility, like is there any number of cats or dogs um, or combination, if it's one, one dog that's small or, you know, is there any consideration of, you know, what kind of space those, um, two species might live in that would change your mind? I think there's always individual situations. If there's a, a house and the bird lives on the top floor and the dog never goes up there or the cat never goes up there, I suppose that kind of a situation might work. But, you know, mm -hmm. there's there's no, any dog, small or large, can, can, can kill a bird. Um, you know, and cats, you know, even if they're raised since they're kittens, you know, everyone sees those videos on YouTube and how cute they are when the kitten and the budgie are playing together, but um, that, that doesn't tend to last. Mm -hmm. There's always exceptions, I, I, I guess. Yeah, and I think um, as a, a rescue group, if you can do a home visit and observe um, the behavior of those animals, certainly would be a, a good way yeah. to make that decision. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I know that this has been an, an exhaustive discussion, um, but I hope that it, it gives um, all of you that are intending a little more information about what are the important things um, to discuss with potential adopters. Um, again, I just want to call attention to some additional resources. I mentioned earlier the GFAS Avian Education page. Um, again, all of our previous webinars are available there. I do want to mention that this is, as I mentioned, the second of our four-part series on adoption. So um, in the next few weeks, we'll have um, two more. One will be talking about um, wills and trusts. Uh, obviously, we're dealing with some long-lived species here. So how do you consider those um, after you, know, you get sick or you, um, you pass? You want to make sure that you're prepared for that. Um, another important adoption question um, that we're going to be addressing is the adoption contract. Um, so both of those discussions will be uh, led by lawyers.
So that gives you a nice opportunity to ask some, some real legal questions um, regarding contracts and wills and trusts. Um, again, Animal Welfare uh, Coalition's shelter resource page uh, has an amazing uh, amount of resources. Um, here's a, a few other of their um, really nice resources on their site. Um, and Denise, did you want to have a final word? Are you still there? <laughs> okay, maybe we lost Denise. Well, I'll give you a final word. Um, so, you know, again, we're dealing with wild animals um, and we're, we're making, we're trying to put them into homes um, where they can be provided with a long life and um, the best possible care. But, um, and, you know, we're trying to give you more information to help you make that possible. Um, but um, obviously there's always gonna be more questions that you have. And I really advocate for um, groups to start, and this was our previous uh, topic uh, in this series, is creating a network of resources that, so that you can ask these questions. You know, people like Janet um, at sanctuaries or Lorelei at clinics, you know, these are the experts in the field that, you know, when you're in trouble or you have questions or you have adopters that have questions, you know, having those resources available to you, um, that's something that you should you know, start doing anytime you're, you're considering putting together an, an avian adoption program. And with that, um, I will conclude. And I really want to thank our speakers today. Um, they did a great job of answering these questions. And I want to thank uh, Robin Mason with GFAS who helped put together the, the presentation uh, with all the questions. And um, if you had questions that were unanswered, um, we will um, distribute those to the, to the speakers so that we can um, address any unanswered questions. Um, but with that, um, Robin, did you have any closing housekeeping? I don't. I think you covered it all. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, great. Well, everybody have a great day, and we'll see you in a couple weeks at our next webinar. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.